Here we have the start of what ultimately proved to be an epic tiebreaker at the 2021 FIDE World Rapid and Bliss Championship. Let's remember that before this Rui Lopez between MBL and JKD that is about to ensue on the board happened, Maxime vache legrav beat world champion Magnus Carlsen in round 21, the final round of the World Blitz Championship. That helped him reach this three-way tiebreaker between MBL, Jan Christoph Duda, and Ali Reza Perugia. But as everyone remembers, because FIDE really knows how to do tie breaks, Ali Reza Perugia didn't even get to play in this. But that is another story. So here we talk about Arroy Lopez. Um, obviously, the the entire chess world had just spent a lot of time looking at these uh, these Spanish games during the World Championship between Jan Nepomneshi and Magnus Carlsen. This exact line was uh, was actually never played, not not this particular move order, but of course, at the high level, so much preparation, you start to see ideas that were played in other games occur in games like this, um, and that's exactly what we're seeing now with this move pawn a4. You induce b4 in these structures because by getting pawn, pa black's pawns to advance further, you're creating potential targets, potential ways to pry open new lines for your pieces. The knight will move to d5 in these positions usually, and then after black has to defend the b4 pawn, white has similar ideas that we saw happen in, in, in some games in the World Championship. Things like c3, and you try to open up the structure for the pieces on the queen side. White's edge is minimal but, but clear in, in these positions, meaning the long-term advantages aren't necessarily there because there are no structural deficiencies in black's position. You don't have any doubled pawns. You don't have any isolated pawns. Nothing that white can really hang their hat on. and so. Even though White's position, if you give this to an engine, is, uh, is a little better. And the engines would say that, that White has an edge here. It's not the kind of position um, that, you can, that you can sleep on. You really have to be accurate or your advantage will dissipate quickly. So here we saw C3 played. The capture on C3, Bishop takes C3. Like I said, if you give this position to an engine, it says White's a little better. Optically, we like White's pieces. They're more active. The knight on D5 is great. But Black has all kinds of ways to try to simplify and, and try to neutralize those active pieces. Dude is going to take his time thinking about his favorite way to do so. Ultimately chooses knight c5, gaining a tempo on the bishop on b3. Maxime trades on f6 with check first in order to free the d5 square for the light square bishop. This is key because you really didn't want to play a move like bishop to c2 there and start to see passivity for white. You really want to keep the pressure wherever possible. Gaining this tempo on the rook forces black to make a big decision. If you move it to a7, which is necessary to keep an eye on the a5 pawn, the rook is a little awkward, and here comes white trying to open the position to take advantage of that. And if, if you pause here and, and, and consider that MBL is about to recapture with the knight on d4, white's edge is, is, uh, has become something at least, right? Uh, the, the active pieces and the threats on the light squares force moves like bishop to d7. So Maxime has gotten about as much as you can get in a lot of these mainline Spanish games these days. White definitely has an edge. But as I said, because black has no long-term weaknesses, no structural problems, you're going to have to convert on it with your edge before any, any trades start to happen. And this is a critical moment right here because after queen to c2, Duda has to think about moves like knight to c6 coming, forking the queen and rook to win the bishop pair. Knight to b5 is a threat. Because of those things, Maxime... Uh, sorry, JKD puts the queen on e8 to try to overprotect it. But this moment right here was actually the only moment Maxime probably had to show and to show and flex the edge that he earned due to this great Rui Lopez prep. He needed to play the move knight to b5. And the idea is you gain a tempo on the rook on a7. So you can't play bishop takes c3 if you're black because if knight takes a7. And if bishop takes b5, you have a takes b5. Because on bishop takes c3 from Duda, white has bishop to c6 first, a little intermezzo tempo on the queen on e8 before recapturing the bishop on c3 with the pawn. That type of endgame would have given Maxime an edge. Unfortunately, he missed that opportunity and settled on knight to b3. But as we're going to see here, this is really just a, uh, a big fancy schmancy trade offering. Um, you, have, you have the bishops, the dark square bishops staring each other down, the knights staring each other down. Really, really, it's going to be hard to keep enough pieces on the board for either side to claim an edge, not, not just Maxime uh, with the white pieces who, who had an edge up until that move knight to b3. So Duda takes on b3, and uh, not, to, not to let the air out of the balloon too much, but for anyone who followed this event live and is enjoying these, these blitz breakdowns by myself and Danya Naroditsky, you might already know what happened in this epic three-game tiebreaker. 
Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot to come in this, in this awesome series, but this particular first game as that, as the minor pieces were traded ended up not amounting to enough for either player. The queen comes to d4 to gain a tempo, which is also a nice move because when that rook moves and the bishop on d5 retreats, Maxime immediately has a threat on the newly weakened d6 pawn because the pawn to c6 move left the d6 pawn vulnerable. These types of things are, are super important, but again, with accurate play, you can already see pieces are being traded. Both sides have enough weaknesses to write home to mom about, right? Black has the targets on b2 and in the e4 pawn and even a4. White can target the d6 pawn and the a5 pawn. So this type of position is, is again suggesting that as, as long as nobody blunders, as long as accurate moves are played, we're probably going to see further simplification. And uh, lucky for these guys, that just means more awesome, awesome blitz games. And lucky for all of you, that just means more, more awesome breakdowns. Uh, so again, for those more studious players of what happened in the theory of this Rui Lopez Spanish, I suggest you go back to the moment I was highlighting where 20 knight b3 allowed white's, white's edge to slip. I actually think before that, this preparation was was pretty high level blitz game or not we know this is a this is a world championship title and these guys came here to win this event so don't let that don't let the uh, time control fool you that prep was actually pretty deep and i think it evolved uh again on a lot of the a lot of the type of spanish ideas we were seeing structurally with the pawn on a4 versus that b4 a5 pawn advance from black between jan nepomnishi and magnus carlson uh during the 2020 world championship in dubai um but as we said, Maxime misses his chance. Doesn't mean that there wasn't wasn't something there. We're headed to a rook ending. Again, as you see, here's the thing, rook a3. If you could have just put that rook from a2 to d2, like an x-ray vision, Superman go through the pawn. You know what? Even then, it's an easy draw. <laughs> That's the thing, because even if you had the rooks doubled, um, black plays a move like rook b4, and there's just no story where all of these weak pawns aren't just traded for each other. So um, that was a fun little anticlimactic. If you could only put the Rook on D2 with a Superman X-ray vision, you'd still have nothing. Hashtag welcome to Rook endings. Um, I'll be here all week, right? Uh, Duda pretends he's going to push a little bit with, with uh, B4, sorry, D4 so that he can put the Rook on B4. And this is, of course, a position that, uh, that Black looks to be the aggressor with the pass D pawn. But as we said, it, really, this is just going to be a fancy trade because at some point, you're going to have to start cashing in on white's weaknesses, which means white will do the same, cashing in on your own. White could take on d4 with the rook or trade on b3 here and take on a5. Both are uh, reasonable ways to reach a drawn ending. You can already see in the body language due to acting real cash. He's a cash kid, super cash. Look at him. He's going to Rick, ro Rick roll his way to a second tie break game. Um, and, uh, and have, and have a, have a good time doing it. We hope you enjoyed this particular video. I know you cannot wait for the breakdown of game two and what was an epic 2021 world blitz championship tiebreaker click on click on that video or uh, wait till next week check out one of Danya's breakdowns in this in this awesome series we have and i'll see you around on chess.com <laughs>